Welcome, teacher friend. I'm Lori. And I'm Melissa. We are two literacy educators in Baltimore. We want the best for all kids, and we know you do too. Our district recently adopted a new literacy curriculum, which meant a lot of change for everyone. Lori and I can't wait to keep learning about literacy with you today. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Literacy Podcast. Melissa and Lori love literacy. Melissa, I am really excited to talk to today's guest because he is such a thoughtful, previous thoughtful school leader, I should say, still thoughtful as a human being. (laughs) Not previously thoughtful. Not previously thoughtful. (laughs) (laughs) But he, um, he, he really started his journey in New York City and then went to NOLA and um, ended up in, I guess what, Louisiana? Giovanni, jump in and help me. I'm I'm struggling with your, your whole <laughs> yeah, history. <that's> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I started, um, thanks for having me. I started yeah. in New York, started in New York City, um, taught up in New York City in Washington Heights um, for about six years. Um, and uh, as a, as a, back then we called it ESL, um, self-contained ESL mm-hmm. actually, um, taught um, sec- kindergarten, first and second grade. And then uh, looks for some change, um, look to learn some more, look to get, um, involved and into education in some different um, realms and uh, different areas. So decided to come on down to New Orleans where a bunch of exciting things were happening with um, school reform and Mm -hmm. um, charter school movement and, um, you know, just closing the achievement and equity gap. So um, I was really excited to just come down here. And I've been here since 2011 um, and not sure when I'm leaving. (laughs) (laughs) Giovanni, I actually was in New Orleans um, until 2005, which as you know, is right when Katrina hit. So I'm excited to hear about what happened after I left because I know it was a (laughs) whole different world. (laughs) And yes, and there were were guests, um, you left in 2005, so there will be six years of gap <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> of what yes. you experienced and what I've experienced. But and I hope I can um do um I hope I can um fill you in on everything that has been going on down here and do uh justice to um all the hardworking uh leaders, teachers and students um in New Orleans and all the work that they're still doing. So yeah. I think that you're particularly interesting um and because you were the school leader of a small charter school. And um, previous to adopting high quality instructional materials, you know, it had been like a homegrown kind of curriculum. And Melissa always talks about that experience in Baltimore. And so I think that that's why I, you know, in Baltimore is like huge. So um, that's why I think I wanted to kind of zoom in on your very uh, small experience as like a little um, vignette of what you know, happens in big Baltimore. Melissa, uh, I, that, that, is that making sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was, like, it was probably right around that time, 2011, Lori, when we started in Baltimore creating our own curriculum um, because we needed to be Common Core aligned, but we didn't have anything. And there, was, there wasn't high quality instructional materials at that time. We had like some textbooks that were throwing stickers on that said Common Core Align, but we didn't truly have mm-hmm. what we have now. And so, it, it, you know, we, we took some time in Baltimore to create our own, which was okay for a little bit. <laughs> um, Only because um, there was nothing better. Because there was nothing better, right. <laughs> that we knew um, about. Let's, let's put that out there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, so definitely curious, Giovanni, how as a school leader, you, you know, yeah. manage that similar journey. Absolutely. Um, I think I to I think a place to start might be um, my first experience with high quality instruction material, which is back in New York um, in 2005 when I started teaching. Um, and we had uh, the high quality. We used Wilson Foundations, um, high quality instructional material for reading foundational skills. And as a first year teacher, um, having that high quality, having that high quality um, curriculum in my hands um, that was systematic, um, systematic routine, research-based, was really helpful in A, my students grow with my students' um, ability to um, learn the code, my students' ability to become proficient readers, but Mm -hmm. then also my my own abilities and my own um, knowledge 
um, and understanding of reading as an educator and as a teacher, um, not going through a traditional, not going through a traditional teacher education program, which most still don't teach um, the base science of reading. Yeah. Anyway, Correct. so I don't know. If, I, I don't think I would have learned it there to begin with. But um, you probably wouldn't have. have. Melissa and I talk a lot about how collectively we've got a lot of schooling, yeah. and we <laughs> didn't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So. Um, yeah, so um, just having that high quality instructional material, those first years of teaching was um, was re- greatly influential, and just my um, perception and my thoughts about um, what a solid curriculum or what a um, yeah, I guess I, 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 I don't want to keep using the word high quality, but I just can't think of anything. <laughs> other than names. But um, yeah, just the impact of what a high quality um, uh, curriculum can have on teachers, students, and like a school and as a whole. Yeah. So, um, and that was great. I loved it. Uh, then moved down to New Orleans. And when I came down here in 2011, um, kind of similar um, to what you were saying, Melissa, we were um, creating plans and they weren't great. Um, trying to create <laughs> them, to trying to create them and align them to Common Core. Right. And it wasn't great. I was just talking to Doing our best though, right? We're doing doing our best. Really doing our best and working really, really, really hard too. Like, (laughs) I I want to put that out there. My first year teaching in New Orleans felt, my first year teaching in New Orleans felt like my first year teaching ever. (laughs) Um, The amount of hard work that was like the amount, like it was hard work and we were working and doing the best we can with what we knew. Um, Yeah. I was talking to just a friend of mine who I worked with that first year and he was saying like, oh, my plans were garbage that year. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But so, um, and then feeling that struggle and um, feel and having that like uh, I guess like pain point really um, after coming from uh, New York and I'll like let me also clarify too in New York we were not all the curriculum we were using was not high quality instruction material we were using curriculum that has been put through web reports and um, we now know that it is not. Um, as not high quality not, as we had thought. Not, not as high quality as we thought. So I'm not saying that. And maybe everybody... we didn't think it was high quality, but you know, they just verified that it was. <laughs> yeah, right. So, um, so not, not to say that everything there was like, um, not say everything there was like um, sunshine and like roses and everything, but. Um, yeah. Yeah. But just again, coming down to New Orleans and being in a place where we were creating our own plans um, was tough and it was challenging and thinking about, and I, at that point, at that time, I was a kindergarten through second grade team leader. And on that team, there were, um, we had about half the team were new teachers. Um, and about like maybe another quarter were teachers that had maybe taught for like three to five years, which is still fairly new. Um, and then, so to be able to learn the, to, 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 to learn to teach, learning to teach, and then Mm -hmm. also being able to, having to design your own plans and your own curriculum was tough. Too Um, much, too much, too too much. much, And like, and and leaders, and and, and leaders really tried their best to give um, scope and sequences and overall unit plans and things that we should follow in creating these plans. They tried and helped as much as they could, but um, just the capacity for teachers um, to do all that work was like really, really challenging. yeah. I imagine that when you did become a school leader, which I think you shared was not long after that, mm-hmm. that those experiences really impacted you. And I also am making the assumption that the the avenue that the state of Louisiana is taking in um, their stance on materials must be tier one, uh, also highly impacted the mm-hmm. massive shift that is happening there. Yeah. Yeah. Um- yeah, exact. Uh, so, hmm, gosh, <laughs> I'm, I'm so, it's so sorry. much to talk about. <laughs> I know, like, where should I be? So, um, so yeah. So, once I became a school leader, about four, five years into um, teaching, and after teaching in New Orleans, um, New Orleans being um, a chart of mainly charter city yeah. mm-hmm. charter network yeah. Yeah. um there were which i think poses its own issues especially for those who are listening and who like who don't know the charter i i actually feel like i i, I understand the charter situation but i couldn't call myself an expert like you and melissa i feel like could be have more of an expertise in that network of yeah and i and i think that um that nature 
um, in the environment of being charters uh, or, ch- or all charter networks provides a lot of um, or leads to a lot of variation from school to school mm-hmm. um, with regards to curriculum um, selection and uh, and teacher leader development. Um, all networks can choose to do can choose the curriculums they would like and also how they choose to develop their teachers and leaders is their decision. But um, there are some organizations, um, New Schools for New Orleans being one of them, um, that helps really um, connect the schools together, support schools. And one of the ways that they um, did support a few years ago was um, creating this IQI grant. And all schools um, or networks were eligible for the IQI grant. But uh, the caveat of um, receiving the grant money was that you had to um, that you had to uh, adopt and implement high quality instructional materials for a certain um, number of years. And those high quality instructional materials were um, the um, curriculums that were designated um, or rated as tier one um, by the state of Louisiana. Mm -hmm. So um, so um, finding out about this and hearing about this grant, I was like, Yes. Oh my gosh, you're gonna give me money and you're gonna give me money and all I have to do is you want to do high anyway. quality instructional <laughs> curriculum. Like that's great. Like I don't know how I can say no. Like you're gonna give me you're gonna give me money to buy good things. Like I don't yeah. that's like kind of like a no-brainer, right? So, it's like here, I'm gonna give you all the money to buy those. What are the fancy shoes with the red at the bottom? <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? I don't even know the designer's name, but I know that I saw it on a TV show and I was like, ooh, and then I Googled it and they're very expensive. But yes, same idea. <laughs> exactly, right? So oh my gosh, now I'm gonna be thinking about I'm I'm gonna really try not to make an analogy. Don't think crit- about the shoes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so it was kind of, they were, it was really like if you want this X amount of dollars, then you will, you can choose from these curriculums um, to implement in your school, adopt and implement in your school for uh, X amount of years. So definitely signed us up for that. And, <laughs> um, and so fortunately, fortunately at, um, before we got this grant, um, the first three years of um, the school, I used to lead the first three years of us opening, uh, we used Wilson's, we used Wilson's foundations just from the experience that I had with it in New York. Mm-hmm. Um, and luckily that was one of the um, mm-hmm. vetted curriculums that we can choose. So it's like, great, we'll just continue to implement this curriculum. And now we have money to buy more materials and we don't necessarily have to share materials and <laughs> we have all of the cards, we have all the magnets, we have everything we need now. Yeah. Um, so so just um, so really um, using that as a time to recommit and like re-energize the um, implementation of that curriculum, but then also adopt um, a knowledge building curriculum, um, an ELA curriculum that, yes, built knowledge and really responded to that um, top strand of Scarborough's braid uh, that like with the language comprehension. Mm-hmm. And that's what we found in wit and wisdom. Yep. Um, and then, so, um, and so we started to implement those two curriculums, uh, those two curriculums side by side. Um, and then for math, of course, um, uh, can I talk about math on this, on this podcast? I know you, you know, no, we have, no, 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 <laughs> <laughs> no math talk here. <laughs> you know, listen, we're not going to like quiz you on fractions or multiples, but you can certainly talk about math. Yes. Yes. We, we that, might just cut it out though. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, yeah. But the, uh, in our math curriculum that we adopted and we had, um, previously had adopted that curriculum, but then with this money, we were able to buy more resources was Eureka Math. Cool. Yeah. So you went all in, all in, all in, and, I, <laughs> and yep, all in. And as a school leader, I had to be really um, transparent about how all in we were going, mm-hmm. yeah, and about how important this shift was, um, and that, and I've had to message multiple times in some professional development, um, in coaching meetings, in data meetings, um, professional development throughout the year that these three curriculum, these three curricula were high priority. These three curricula are the ones that we're going to follow with mm-hmm. fidelity. We have to like know these rules before we can break them. Mm-hmm. These are going to be the three curricula that you get the most coaching, the most support in, um, lesson it, unit in, unit internalization, lesson internalization, student work analysis, classroom observation, peer observation, all of those um, forms, all of those areas of, all those ways to develop and learn the curriculum and just really implement it with success 
that's what these three curricula we're going to focus on this year. I like Uh, that. I like that you focused, A, you shared that with everybody, but B, you focused everything that you did around that. Like it was just a big group hug of high quality (laughs) curricula. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and and there was a time and I did have like, and teachers ask and um, seek development and support with science and social studies. I'm like, yeah, we're still going to teach science and social studies. Like don't think that that (laughs) isn't happening, but in regards to, how where you're going to be really developed and what's going to be the most high leverage for a students and then B for you as an educator right now, it's going to be development in these curricula because a, our science and social studies curricula weren't high quality either. So, Hey, let's like get really, really let's, let's get, let's become really great implementers of wit and wisdom because embedded in all of wit and wisdom is a ton of science and social studies. Right. right. So like, let's just think, and we'll, um, and we'll supplement it there in that way, but just really being clear with teachers and um, team members in that way. And of course, if like a teacher wanted an observation or support with science and social studies, I wasn't going to say no, right? But, right, right? but when it comes down to like, hey, we have a PD day here, we're going to spend three hours looking at this high quality instructional material rather than spending three hours or half a day developing mm-hmm. some social studies plans or looking at like a less, a less than high quality curricula. So Giovanni, can you give some examples or talk a little bit about how your teachers actually felt that shift in the first year and what you as a school leader did to support them through it? Um, Uh, Yeah. Challenges. (laughs) And I've I've spoke to other leaders um, in other parts of the country and other parts of the city too. um, And um, I know that making this shift often there is um, some pushback and some um, some doubt by teachers. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, I didn't really have much of that, which I, thankfully, um, I know it is a thing, but I didn't have much <laughs> of it. And I think that part of it came from the place of just really being clear with teachers and really how, letting them under, just being clear with them and empathizing with them in the space of like, I know and I understand how difficult and how challenging teaching can be and all the things that go into it. Yeah. Um, the social emotional um, and the, the social emotional learning, um, the operations and the logistics, just everything that goes into teaching that isn't actually instruction in front of children. Right. And empathizing with them and hearing that and saying like, I see these things. I know these are challenges. I know these are hard. And like, if you are, and you are doing so much work and you're doing the best you can to respond to all of these other things, let's take one thing off of your plate, which is curriculum development and lesson design. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people out there that are getting paid money and that's their job to do. Their whole job. (laughs) Their whole job. There's a bunch of people who just get paid to do that. And your job as a teacher and your job as an educator is to really do the exciting stuff of taking that high quality instruction material and delivering it to in a way that is accessible to your students and making it and making it come alive for your students. And that's what a teacher really can do. So it's pretty much like you're doing you you're doing all you're doing the hard work. There's all these people doing this other type of hard work. Let's just use this so that you can like be the teacher that you want to be. Yeah. Um, And I I think that they really, I think a lot of them really responded to that. Yeah. What I think you mentioned in our pre-call is, um, I mean, I just think you're, the way that you support teachers or supported teachers, I should say, in that you were a thought partner with them. So you got, you know, you jumped in, and, and swam right beside them. You were Absolutely. in it doing the work of Absolutely. the protocols. You weren't, you weren't just like, here, these protocols are oh. super helpful, right? Like you, you can talk to those protocols because you know them because you oh, did them all. A hundred percent. Those protocols, yeah. everything. And it's, um, and I, and I had to, and I was transparent with teachers about that too, in regards to how much preparation I was going to do in order to develop them. Um, and if I'm doing this much preparation, if I'm reading all of the text, if I'm looking at the module overviews, if I'm looking at the protocols, if I'm planning them ahead of time, if I'm using what happened in our last session to respond and to develop the plans for this next session, if that's the work that I'm, that's all the work that I'm doing to prepare for you. That's also the same work as a teacher that you're doing for your students. And you wouldn't, 
expect a teacher to, sh- like as a teacher, you wouldn't want to just show up um, or we wouldn't expect teacher to just show up and read the plan for at the first glance and then expect students success. Like that's not going to happen. So I think them seeing my level of involvement, my level of commitment um, and my level of wanting to learn more mm-hmm. and being a like lifelong learner and wanting to just better myself and know better, do better for myself and for our kids. That's like also what I'm asking from you. Yeah. Uh, and what, also what your think. knowledge building, like yeah. you, like, I, I think it's, it's special that you had this great experience at a small school uh, that, you know, where you had a lot of folks who were on board likely because of your transparent communication and thoughtful leadership. But um, you also built your knowledge so that you're, you weren't just talking about like, oh, you know, grade four, module one. You're like, no, grade four, module one. Love that dog. It's the cortex. And here's why it's like, oh. here's why it's important. Here's what I, here's what resonated with me. What are you thinking? Like, you can really get in the weeds. And I think that's, I don't know. I, when I loved that when I was a teacher, yeah. I always respected that so much from leaders. Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. I love, so I mean, you mentioned knowledge building. I, yeah, so definitely building knowledge. Um, I went to Fordham for my undergrad, um, Jesuit, Jesuit philosophy of like lifelong learners. Um, mm-hmm. I fully, truly believe in it. Um, <laughs> and that's the, and that's why I really loved, again, implementing this, implementing a new curriculum and implementing wit and wisdom and just being able to learn more, um, A, about, just learn more about the world and also learn mm-hmm. more about high quality um, instruction that's based, that's research-based. Um, it was, um, really great and it's interesting that you say that about love that dog because the year, <laughs> because the year that we had my background is uh, mainly my instructional background is mainly kindergarten through second grade mm-hmm. and the year that we adopted wit and wisdom we actually added fourth grade which is great i never taught before and it was a new fourth grade teacher <laughs> so it was great because i could have t- i could have spoke about wit and wisdom k2 and try and by uh created buy-in with k2 stuff like easily like that's like that's my jam. Like I love K2. Like, I, <laughs> it's my, my, yeah. My, see, yeah. Like my team knew that that was my background. They knew that like, Oh, he has some knowledge in this stuff. Like, mm. you know, but then to see me really work with the fourth grade teacher in a grade level, I've never taught before and content I have not taught before. And with the teacher who has not taught this before and us doing that together was like, I am now they think about it. That probably also had a lot to really a lot, a lot to do with like the actions that I took as an instructional leader and also then the actions and the mindsets that followed for uh, teachers on my team. Absolutely. That, like, I, never thought, <laughs> I never really thought about it like that. Yeah. Thanks, Lori. Like you stepped out of your comfort zone, right? Yeah. And let them see it. <laughs> yeah. It is, and I guess I didn't, and I guess I didn't realize I didn't, it didn't feel like stepping out of my comfort zone though, I guess, because it was just so exciting. Yeah. It was just so exciting to like, it was so exciting to know that, oh, this is, this is a first, this is a teacher who's never taught fourth grade before. Uh, and knowing that like, she could really love teaching fourth grade and teaching fourth grade ELA because with this curriculum and like, I'm so excited to like bring her along the journey and like learn this and bring these students. It was just, it, yes, it didn't feel, it, I think the excitement of it all made it feel, made the, made the, alleviated some of the discomfort. If that makes sense. Yeah. I, I, um, I love that you're having an epiphany and (laughs) I think you really modeled getting uncomfortable. That's, that's amazing. And And excitement about it. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so I'm, um, I'm wondering how you as yourself as a leader, when you were a leader, uh, not that you're not still a leader again, you're thoughtful and a leader still all those things. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but you, you shared, um, that you were able to build your own network with other leaders, implementing high quality instructional materials and deepen your knowledge of standards so that you could really talk this talk with your teachers. Um, can you share a little bit about, um, like when you built your own network with other leaders, how did that help you? Yeah. Hmm. It's a great question. Um, I think the way I kind of think a lot about um, like the classroom and the teacher level being like a microcosm of like the whole school and 
<laughs> cool being like my cosmic district. And I think um, the things that would, the same benefits that um, a teacher would get from um, collaborating with teachers on their team, um, I think is the same benefits that I kind of, that I got as a leader collaborating with other leaders, implementing high quality instructional material. Um, I could have, yes, of course, uh, I would spend time observing my teachers um, and looking at um, their lesson implementation and then looking at that student work, um, but then not being able to, but not, yeah, not being able to reflect on your own practices um, and improve them through um, comparison, contrast, and collaboration with other leaders, um, it's kind of, it would, it would be, is difficult. So yeah. um, I think it's like definitely. You were able to get out of your bubble and exactly. see other things and, and hear other, others' experiences. Exactly. That yeah. That influenced you a bit. Yeah. And then, on, and then recognizing too, um, in regards to things that we were doing well and things that we needed to, things that we needed to fix. Um, and it was really great to recognize some of the things that we were doing well already, because then I was able to communicate that with teachers as well, as in like, oh, I saw this as a struggle. I was talking to this leader, this is a struggle there. This is not a struggle that we have. I remember, I, I remember even telling them before at one time, and I think it was, it was like our second year of implementation. I remember even saying to them that a lot of other school leaders have gotten um, push back and some resistant and develop and implemented this curriculum. And I want to say that that's something that we really don't experience here and that we're not experiencing and just naming that for them and just thanking them for that. Um, mm -hmm. It was really empowering and really um, supportive, especially like when things are really challenging and when your um, your when your when your lesson goes across two to three days and it's supposed to take seventy five minutes um, and you're still <laughs> right. Um, just knowing that we are that there are some wins in other areas um, just keeps that um, you know keeps that motivation going to want to keep on improving and keep on um, implementing with fidelity to hopefully lead to success, even when like the going gets tough. Um, so yeah. yeah, I think that's kind of like the big, and I think that was probably the most support from other school years because then again, a lot of us were implementing this. So not, none of, no, none of us really had the answers either. <laughs> it wasn't like we, I could go to one leader and be like, oh, and they have like, I, this is, oh, this is like a challenge. This lesson took four days and they're like, oh, it took us three. So like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, how did you get it? How did you cut that one day down? So, but it wasn't like no one really actually had the answers, but definitely, um, a place where we were able to compare our contest, collaborate, and then use that for reflection um, in, in later improvement. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's one of those things that like, as you trudge through the mud, you can, you get better and better at, right? Like pacing is totally one of those things. You have to go <laughs> through the hard stuff before you yeah. can exactly. come out on the other side. <laughs> um Oh, sorry, Melissa, were you going to ask a question? Yeah, I do have a question. Go ahead. <laughs> so I was thinking about um, our leaders. I realized we haven't had many principals on this, on our podcast. I know. I, that's why I was really excited. <laughs> I was going through my list. I was like, wait, we just had Daisy on, but she's like a new principal, hasn't even started yet, you know? And, uh, okay. not, but, and uh, Actually, so anyway. we haven't really, well, hopefully by the time this episode launches, we would have released that one. Yeah, we will. Oh, wait, did we release Did we release it? We, we released did, we it. Did. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we did. It was the 50th episode. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but I often think of in Baltimore when we rolled out Wit and Wisdom, you know, we talk about the mind mindset shifts that have to happen at the teacher level. But then I was just thinking about, you know, our some of our principals might not have that mindset shift. And then we also have our principal supervisors who – also, some of them don't have, haven't had that mindset shift. And I'm wondering if you had any experience with that of like, you know, um, I mean, you were in the middle, right? If there's any yeah. like tension between like, I mean, you, you already had the shift because you were, you were leading the charge. Yeah. So you didn't experience that. But wondering if you had any other, was there anyone above you that maybe um, was hard, to, was pushing against what you were doing? I wouldn't necessarily say that I ha I've had leaders that were pushing against um, what we were doing or are pushing against the implementation of high quality instructional material that's based in research and rooted in the science of reading. Right. Um, <laughs> I don't think that there was really a push back, but yeah. um, 
there were definitely some um, moments and times of of um, of wanting to quickly go back to some past practices. Yeah. Or like make it look, make this new thing look like the old thing. <laughs> a little bit, a little, yeah, a little bit like that. <laughs> yep, a little bit like that. Exactly. Or trying to it's fit, the, yeah. Or trying to fit the new thing into like, yeah. Into the I whole, think that's trying to fit the new peg into the hole of the old <laughs> right. thing. I guess right. I don't know if that makes sense, right? <laughs> but it's kind of something like that, and where um, and wanting to do, make those decisions based off of um. The, the, the challenges that schools face, like, and the challenges that, um, and the, and the reality of running a school and keeping a school open, um, there's standardized tests and there's yeah great. And there's numbers and there's grades that are given to schools and those numbers matter if the school stays open or not. And I could definitely hear and see the, I don't agree with it, but I can see the rationale for some up higher level leaders of like, yep, we can follow this high quality instructional material, but like, we don't have three years to wait for the effects of it. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and then, and then that's when trying to fit that. And that's when trying to make this new thing seem like the old thing and like trying to find like, Hey, where are all the inferencing lessons for? <laughs> yeah. And if we, You're like, we're inferencing every day, every day. Right. Exactly. It's and it's just right. not called inferencing. And, yeah, inferencing yeah, lessons. Right? And it's, yeah. And it's not a matter of that. Like, Oh, there's a unit on main idea with five lessons. And then if they get yeah. main idea after three lessons, then, Oh, you're ahead of pacing and you don't need to do the other two. And I was like, right. Yeah. And I want to say <laughs> like, right. Like, I feel oh. like that resonates with everyone out there. It's like, Oh, your students got, um, got you know can really do main idea and details check that box we're done teaching main idea and details. mastered it you mastered it you yeah. mastered that skill and literally that never happens there are things that I read as an adult that I cannot identify the main idea if you put a stem cell research paper like article in front of me that's 100 pages long I, I, I would struggle I mean I'd be <laughs> able to read it but it would be very hard and I'd probably need a lot of talking and thought partnering with other adults <laughs> to understand it. <laughs> like it, there's just, it's just crazy to think that like, check, we're main idea. Check. We get that now. Like no yeah. more. It's so wild. It's wild. And I think, and I, and two, it's like, it's, it's wild, but also it's, it makes me think about how much time school leaders actually have to build their own knowledge and have to like build True. their own understanding and then be able to use that understanding and knowledge when they're making decisions based off of curriculum adoption, yeah. um, teacher development, scheduling, all of those things. Like how much time do leaders have to do this research? Because I, I like myself as a leader, like I, I granted I'm able to do like a little more research now, not in the daily day-to-day -day school life, but as a school principal, like you don't have time to really always listen to like, the podcast about the science of reading. You don't have those. <laughs> yeah. things, right? You don't have like, where do you, how do you find the, how do you find the time to read the knowledge gap? And like, yeah, you know, what's really funny is um, one of my good friends is a principal in Baltimore city. And he called me the other day and he, I didn't even, I like, didn't even say hello. And he's like, I hate you and Melissa too. I was like, oh, I <laughs> he's like, I know so much now. It's just really hard to do my job. <laughs> you made my job so much harder. And I was like, that's so good. I love this. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. So much harder. I like think now, like I, I think too, like, I wish I knew as much as I know now, like even as a teacher. And there's moments right. like, yes. oh my oh, God, do sure. I want to go back and teach first grade again? And like, right. really apply all of this? Not just yet, but who knows? Uh, I know. Um, keep, I'll, that, I'll, keep that teaching cert. <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take a few more years of research and then go back. In. <laughs> That's but what we so had. Um, Margaret, uh, is it her, Margaret? Is it her last from name? The right, from yeah. the Right to Read Project. Yes. Yeah. I always mix up everybody's last names, uh, Margaret and Lonnie, but I think it's Margaret Goldberg. Um, Margaret was on from the Right to Read Project and she went back and was a first grade teacher after she was a researcher and did all this work. And I was like, that's just so cool. Like it, yeah. what she yeah. shared about, I mean, she's like in the trenches with the teachers and, and the leaders. And it's so exciting to hear her voice. I mean, and Lonnie's too. Lonnie from the Right to Read Project is an assistant principal and same thing. They both did a lot of work for many years 
learning the, the science of reading, yeah. internalizing it. And, and they're still huge advocates and doing a lot of work with it, but they're, they're now back in schools. They could have yeah. easily had this be their, their, their full-time jobs. And I just think it's so cool that they right. did that. But I think you bring up a good point that, I mean, our school leaders often get caught up in those day-to-day every, yeah. you know, I mean, especially this year, my goodness. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, I mean, especially. it's not like, uh, it's not always their fault that they're not no. on no. top of everything. Exactly. Um, and I think, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't mean to cut you off. No, no. please go. No, no. Yeah. I think it's like just, um, and in the place of where, and it's like, depending on the school leader, like I thought of being a school leader as being a teacher of, as being the teacher of teachers. <laughs> That's kind of like how I looked at it. That's what, that was my mindset around um, being a school principal, um, academic director, um, that I am the teacher of teachers and wanting the professional development and the coaching and the times that I was with them to ha- be opportunities where they're also building their knowledge of pedagogy and their knowledge of the science of reading. Mm-hmm. But then as a school leader, um, are there network level or district level, like this is like public charter, private, whatever. Um, are there upper level leaders there that are developing their principles in that way? Or, cause I felt like, or I see that a lot of like principal leaders, a lot of principal development winds up being like leadership development. Yeah. yeah. And, it's, and it's so funny because we asked, like when you implement high quality curriculum, you stray from pet, like, which is a good thing. You're not just doing like basic you know, pedagogy development for teachers. You are deep in the curriculum and the pedagogy mm-hmm. development is embedded within the materials that you're teaching. So shouldn't it be the same for leaders? Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, and that's how I, like, so I'm like, um, and then to clarify too, my, my, um, I was a principal of the school and then the year that I left, I was assistant principal and I stepped down and like to be like more of an academic director because there were the principal stuff that like, it wasn't for me. And it wasn't that they, like, <laughs> it was, it's just like, yeah. I, <laughs> was very immersed in wanting to teach teachers and help them learn. And, um, that was where my, um, passion was. And then as a principal, a lot of your development, yes, it has become not about pedagogy and more, and it's very, and the development is necessary development. I'm not going to say that it wasn't helpful as a leader to, Mm -hmm. to lead a school, but also, you know, the leader has to be like as knowledgeable. Yeah as the people on the team, I would say. So yeah, know. for sure. Such a good point. Um, and I just realized actually that we like just jumped into the podcast with you. So nobody even knows your last name or what you do, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe when you, when you leave your piece of advice, you could be like, hi, I'm Kalani. <laughs> <laughs> nice to talk to you for the past hour. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So yeah, my name is Giovanni Ramos. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's funny. Cause I just like, I'm, I'm staring at your name on zoom and I'm like, you know what? I don't think we did an introduction, which is really fun because because we just jumped into content. Everybody's going to be, be gripped by your stories. <laughs> and, and, and then, and then I reveal like who I really am and what I actually do. I'm like, who's this, who's this guy? <laughs> no, I'm sure they, that, I mean, the, just the fact that you're a school leader who I love, love, love that you think of thought of yourself when you were a school leader, that you were teach a teacher of teachers. I mm-hmm. think that's brilliant. Um, and I feel like it, Melissa, is it time? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. Go ahead. You, you yeah. Giovanni, you ready to give some advice to our audience? Oh gosh. This are you is ready? Are you ready? He looks so scared. scared. Right. You look really, like, you look really <laughs> nervous. I was like, it's yeah, right? just advice. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Oh, one piece of advice, right? One piece of advice. I think the piece of advice that I would give to um, not just not just school leader principal, but uh, school leaders as in like middle level school leaders as well, directors of curriculum academics, like teacher leaders, like teachers mm-hmm. that are in the classroom and still also coach those uh, leaders. Um, I think the biggest piece of advice I would give is to you have to go down this journey and go on this path with your team Mm -hmm. and not as in, and I'm thinking I'm having this visual of like walking down the path together Mm -hmm. and not as in, or not one of the two, two things as in like, 
oh, the leader, like you're at the end of the path and you're saying like, come on over here, guys. Like, come <laughs> you, right? But or also the leader, like at the beginning of the path and saying like, all right, head on go out. Ahead, go. Yeah. Just, like, no, you got to like walk it and do it with yeah. them and like be a part of it and go through the highs, the lows, the celebrations, the challenges. Like you have to live all of that with them. And not even just for like that first year of implementation, like mm-hmm. it's an ongoing thing. And I feel like even as a point, when I left, when I um, left my school, I don't even like, I, if I was still there, I would still continue to be walking down this path with them mm-hmm. and probably having to do that until you get to a place where there are enough other teachers and leaders and whole school uh, support where now when anyone new comes in, there's enough people to like take them on that path and on that journey too. Mm-hmm. That's such good advice. <laughs> and beautiful visual. Thank you. <laughs> I lo- This is so much fun. And I'm so happy that uh, Melissa and I had had written on our, our wish list of guests. Like we need to talk to school leaders, but we don't want to bog, like, bog them down right now because we know yeah. they're insane with getting kids <laughs> back to school, hybrid, oh I, probably thinking about next year. Who knows what's going on? Gosh, I mean, the only people that know how to lead a school during the pandemic and people doing it now. I have, yeah. I have so much admiration and respect <laughs> for all of them. Like the work that they're doing is like. Bravo. Fantastic. So for I'm sure. so grateful that you all, uh, <laughs> that you both are like, have this podcast. So when they do get those moments to, <laughs> you know, um, fill up their bucket a bit. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm happy that they got to hear your voice and, uh, and I'm, we're, we just thank all the school leaders out there and we're, we're, Grateful that we finally got to talk with um, a school, a former school leader who implemented high quality materials. So thank you. Of yeah. course, thanks for having me. It's thank been a blast. you. You yeah. said this is going to be fun. It really I was. told you. <laughs> <laughs> so you talk about you talk about your experiences for an hour and just pretend like you're holding a glass of wine. It's really fun. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much, Giovanni. This was such fun, and uh, you. just your wisdom is incredible so thank you and have an awesome rest of your day and we will talk soon Thanks have so fun much. in new orleans yes, I I miss it. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.